When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind around with John Pollock and waiting. The 18 that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind around for Monday night, then load a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Way take the mic. And we are live. It is John Pollock and waiting with you on this Monday evening. April the 15th, and it is such a big show that we're getting feedback Amateur. already. Amateur before. hour. Look at this. What are we doing? How are you, Way? Doing well. How are you? Uh, I'm okay. I'm fine. Good. All right. Good. I'm happy to hear it. I almost buy it. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll see how things go. How was your weekend? Uh, yeah, not bad. Yeah. No, uh, uh, I, had a, I had a good weekend. Yeah. How is how is this coming weekend going to be for you? What are you doing on Sunday morning? Jesus Christ. I will be walking vertically up a very tall building. One of the tallest freestanding structures in the entire world. I'll be doing this again for the second time in my lifetime. Hopefully um, at an even better pace than the previous year. And I won't be doing it alone. N you won't be? No, there no, will actually right. be a lot of people. We're actually going in at the very end, so it's going to be sweaty as hell. Oh, it's God. going to be disgusting. Great, but uh, but yeah, we're doing the CN Tower climb again this year, aren't we? We are. Yes, it is uh, creeped up. It is uh, six days away that we are going to be doing this. Um, <laughs> God knows why, but uh, we we are. And this one has. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm cramming for an exam this week. That's what that's, I feel like. That's how I feel feel too. Like you know when I signed up for this. Like last year, certainly, but like especially this year, the the thought is okay. Like we know we're gonna do this. Let's like, uh, I don't know, use the next six months to prepare for it. Oh yeah, we did a wonderful job. Yeah, tons well, of off season training. You know, I I kind of wish we just like did terrible last year because I think I have I had this false sense of security that like last year I seriously prepared for it. Like I'm talking like a good four to five weeks of like. I'm not going to say intense training, but like pretty good and was ready for this. Uh, this one, I mean, I have, I've been preparing for this, but nothing like last year. We also had a trip thrown in there two yeah. weeks out from this. And now it's, um, you know, it's fight week and it's like, man, just going to try and cut the weight and, and see how things go on. I, I, I'm not optimistic about beating my time, but Hey, let's, let's find out. I'm going to give it my all on Sunday. Yeah, this is like, you know, where like maybe, you know, you make your UFC debut and like you win in like, you know, the first round and like, oh, that wasn't so bad. This, you know, this maybe UFC I, stuff is easy. Maybe I overprepared. So then you get into your second fight. You're like, yeah, <laughs> not a big deal. Dude, George St. Pierre oh. against Matt Serra the first That's time. That's it. That's it. It's what yeah. I felt like today as I was all these people giving me looks as I'm just going up and down these stairs as they're all commuting home from work. <laughs> It, uh, you, a lot you, of people you, in this you city, you don't really get any privacy to find a giant set of stairs that you can just go up and down and up and down. So I, I had to compete with like a group of kids, you know, sitting at um, a, a part of the stairwell, um, just like hanging out, smoking weed. And um, I felt like such a such an old man, you know, <laughs> can you please move aside so I can use these steps for my daily exercise? And they're very nice about it. Um, but. Uh, yeah, we hate to be those guys, but we have we're doing it for a great cause, aren't we? Yes. What is that good cause? Way where can where how how can we alert people to what we're doing and how they can uh, push us across the finish line this Sunday? This is the WWF Climb for Nature in support of the World Wildlife Fund. Look at this beautiful poster here, um, and uh, we are doing it, of course, with our friends at Poison Rana, Braden Harrington, Davey Portman, who I think among all of us really has the most daunting task of trying to break his 18-minute mark last time. So um, I think he might be up for it. He seems like a, you know, very, very capable. We're also doing this with our friends Jesse from The Six and Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, himself. He's going to be showing up in a Kangol hat, and we're going to be um, looking forward to, um, yeah. you know, 30 feet up by hearing someone yell, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I've, I've uh, 
you know, I, I, I didn't even know um, he was a fan of ours or at least uh, listened to the show. So very excited to do this with uh, Poison Rana, Jesse and Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, you, you know, we, you, we've already um, just from today posting on social media received a lot of support. In fact, uh, our initial goal was seven hundred fifty dollars, um, just so which is the bare minimum. I think we had to raise in order for us to even like participate. So we managed to reach that. So thank you, everybody who, who um, uh, donated just even of that tier. So we decided to up upgrade our goal to fifteen hundred and within the day we reach that we surpassed 1500 already so we're currently sitting at 1517 dollars i'm feeling ambitious okay i think we could really like destroy our total last year which was which was 1700 i think we got to aim big we got to aim higher than the cn tower three thousand dollars can we do it if we do, we'll put out a press release next week and we'll announce what percentage increase we performed over last year, but we won't give the actual dollar figure. Okay, got it. We'll yes, go totally we'll TKO, okay? Yeah, wonderful. Hey, $3,000 we have until Sunday. Please, uh, you know, support a great cause, the World Wildlife Fund, the, the, the only WWF that matters throughout history, the company that beat Vince, okay? If that's not enough for it to earn your support, then I don't know what is. How about us climbing in the CN Tower? $3,000 is our goal. Postwrestling.com slash WWF. Get the F in this coming Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. And we will uh, we will remind you throughout the week as we are, are raising funds for a good cause. And, and then we're going to find that breakfast spot that we went to last year. Oh, yes. that was a pretty any meal would have tasted great last yeah. year, but we found a pretty good spot. I'd even drink prime after this. Let's not get wild. I oh. would rather vomit and just take that back. <laughs> Okay. Let's get into the news items for uh, tonight, and then at the end we'll go over the, uh, the some of the shows coming up. Uh, sad news over the weekend: it was uh, reported that uh, that Tony Jones, who was a Northern California-based independent wrestler, uh, died at the age of fifty-three. He is most remembered for his role in Beyond the Mat, where he was one of the. They had sectioned it where you had like the aging legend in Jake Roberts and Terry Funk, then you had sort of Mick Foley was originally cast as like, you know, this is before he caught fire in the WWF when the filming began. And then he becomes the star during this peak of WWF's popularity, which was interesting in and of itself because WWF agreed to um, basically let Barry Blaustein and his crew have all of this access at a time when they were behind WCW. And you're going to be a lot more welcoming of different movie projects when you're behind in the race. And then by the end of it, um, Vince McMahon hated this movie uh, by the time it uh, came out. And that was a whole big thing. But then they had like the two uh, kind of two talents who were on the independent scene looking for their big break in Michael Modest and Tony Jones. And Jones was only about a year and a half into his career. And they both get uh, dark matches before raw in September of 98. That's what's featured in the doc. And you see, um, you know, just the, the, the three of them going to the arena and getting, a, getting, you know, advice from Jim Ross at the time. And, you know, the line about, uh, t you know, Tony Jones has potential, Modest is ready. And that was uh, one of many uh, memorable quotes from, from that film. That, uh, yeah, but Tony Jones, he was like a, uh, a regular on the Northern California independent scene when Michael Modest and Donovan Morgan, they kind of separated from All Pro Wrestling, which was Roland Alexander's group, who is featured in the documentary. They formed Pro Wrestling Iron, and Jones worked there for a number of years, then would come back to All Pro Wrestling and did do several bits of enhancement work for WWE, but never signed there. Did go over to Japan for, for Battle Arts um, for, for a tour or several tours, and then wrapped up his career in the late 2000s, around 2009, did come out of retirement a few years ago for some like farewell matches. Um, also had a personal tragedy back in 2014 when his daughter died at the age of 14, which was, uh, of course, just a uh, devastating, um, you know, thing to deal with uh, for, for any parent uh, as well. But um, yes, passing away over the weekend at 53 years of age. So our condolences to uh, Tony Jones that, again, m many people will remember from, from Beyond the Mat, which was, yeah, I, I was thinking about this with this news story way is that there is so much now documentaries with pro wrestling and it's 
like we have such a like immense amount of these types of projects like do you feel a beyond the mat would have been would have grabbed people to this degree now versus when it did come out in like this this was released in like late 99 and in 2000 like a theatrical release nonetheless um but it's like if you if you lived through this time like this was such a big deal that professional wrestling was getting this kind of uh, focus with a a major like for, for a documentary it was like a pretty well well promoted doc mm -hmm. i think if uh, given a similar amount of access like to the wwe then i think yeah like to me this is a documentary that to, it, it's still like the standard when it comes to you know the best um films even re released about professional wrestling and i think so so much of that is is just not just the fact that it's covering professional wrestling but, but because it got it did such a good job of it you know there are scenes like the stand by me scene with mcfoley and, and and the rock that mm, in any era you know would would be just completely i don't know captivating um, so if they had a similar level of access uh, to, you know, the biggest promotion in the world, like the WWE right now, um, I think, yeah, it would still be a very relevant release. Yeah. And like the Wrestling with Shadows documentary, like you go in with sort of an idea of what your story is going to be, and then something falls on your lap. It, I wouldn't say to the degree of the Survivor Series for Paul J and Wrestling with Shadows, but in Beyond the Mat, it's that Royal Rumble match with Mick Foley and The Rock. And then all those months later, when they have the footage of Mick Foley sitting down and watching the match and you have him on camera thinking like, I, I don't feel like such a great parent right now, like watching this. And it was sort of just another match for him at the time. And when he's seeing his family and how they're reacting in the crowd, like it, it's horrifying footage. And, and that was a big part of the, the WWF not wanting to get behind this or promote this. And so beyond the mat, I mean, they went with the tagline, the the movie that Vince McMahon doesn't want you to see and that like they use that to their advantage but even you know despite the fact that Vince McMahon was adamantly opposed to the finished copy of this this is one of the most proudest uh things that Mick Foley has stated like in his career that he was part of like he was you know he is probably the most endearing figure of this entire documentary like Jake does not come off well in it I, I think Terry Funk is very well respected in the documentary, but it's it's Mick Foley that I think you is really the star of this doc. I'd agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Windy City Riot over the weekend. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole thing because uh, Karen Peterson and Bruce Lord have an extensive review of the card, which went down Friday night at the Wintrust Arena in Chicago. But want to hit on uh, a couple of the news items. Of course, John Moxley beating Tetsuya Naito for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, but I guess the most talked about individual on this show was Jack Perry and the fact that this was happening just days after the footage release from All In and that this show was taking place in Chicago with Jack Perry taking on Shota Umino, which was very much positioned as Jack Perry wrapping up with New Japan. And I, I would say was like the most talked about thing on the entire show. And the reaction was really interesting to see. And if it's something that can be sustainable for Jack Perry once he goes back to AEW. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's probably like the one bit of uh, uh, undeniably positive, you know, uh, result that's come as a result of this footage being aired for AEW. Everything else that has come as a result of, of airing that footage, I, I think has been already, already less than a week uh, removed, debated to death by now. But I think everybody could agree that Jack Perry at least on the Friday, came out of this looking like that much bigger of a star. And I, it's not simply because the footage aired. It's not simply because this match took place in Chicago days afterwards. It's because um, Jack Perry was excellent in the role and knew exactly what to do to play the heel in front of this crowd. Came out... Um, who, who didn't get a 100% heel reaction either. I mean, there was... True. There was mm -hmm. you know, dueling chants of pro and anti-Jack Perry. And sometimes you... You look at things and someone that's in the middle, it just does not work. This is one of those instances where whether it's pro or con, it's a great reaction for him. And he played off uh, both of them very effectively. Now, this is Chicago, um, but a lot of times like a, this was not just some like this was 6000 people in Chicago and a lot of audiences. They're going to mimic what they see and. I don't doubt that it's going to be a very heated reaction when Jack Perry returns in AEW. It's taking this and putting it into a substantive story when 
the other key player, you're not building to a match with CM Punk and you're not building to a match with Tony Khan, which are the two key people that I think the audience looks at uh, when in, when relating it to the Jack Perry story. The dueling heel babyface reactions were very, very interesting. And I think like you, even as far back as like, um, I don't know, CM Punk being being around or at least mentions of CM Punk being being made in, in the aftermath of uh, his firing with AEW shows in Chicago, you've got a sense of like, you know, even within Chicago crowds kind of being split on, you know, who they felt was right and who they felt was wrong. Um, after the footage aired even, um, that that's only become more the case here. So I'll, I'll be very curious to see what, um, non-Chicago crowds um, react, how they react to a Jack Perry, and how AEW handles it. I mean, I think it feels pretty evident that like you can expect him to join the elite at this point, maybe as heels as part of a group. Um, but who are they opposing against? What if Jack Perry, uh, Perry gets huge baby face reactions? Then what becomes of an FTR who who has to oppose that? So, um, but but bottom line, like. This is a case where for him, any reaction, I think, is a good reaction. You know, he comes in back into AEW as somebody who's who's notable and much more relevant and talked about than before. Um, and I thought Friday was a really good sign that they he, he at least seems to have a very good understanding of how to portray this character. Did it change at all any of your thoughts la last week just in terms of... Um... It, like, yeah. like it, it overall, I think was a pretty um, negative response that AEW received, and and I can't say that this uh, changed my opinion of it. But you have to look at this on its own. That for this night, this definitely enhanced Jack Perry. It felt like the most engaged people have been in in Jack Perry, and he's mm -hmm. at least coming back to AEW with momentum and some interest to see what what they're going to do with it. The question is, like, is this something you can sustain? When the fact is the the key people involved here are are not are not around and yeah. that's to the storytelling process I so I've thought about that. You know, was it was it worth airing the footage in order to get this result? Now, we don't know what the result in AEW is going to be yet. But I also kept wondering if this would have been the result anyway for Jack Perry appearing in Chicago for the first time since all that happened without suffering some of the PR like, you know, detriment of of airing that footage on 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 Wednesday. Um, certainly it brought everything up to the forefront and on top of people's minds and probably made the reaction that much bigger. But would it have been big enough anyway for them to be able to, to tell a Jack Perry story like this way without suffering some of those ill consequences? Listen, like we, we all have talked about it um, a lot, um, but a year from now it's not really going to matter a whole lot. You know, if AEW continues to, to, to win and do well and create new characters, and that could be a Jack Perry, could be somebody else, then sure, we could look back and say it was worth it. Um, if they, I don't know, continue on I, um, I, I, some sort of like flat um, trajectory or even a, a downward trajectory, then people are going to point it to it and say that that was not a good move. In a year's time, it's, it's probably going to be somewhat negligible the, the the ultimate effect uh they it also featured a uh, zach saber jr beating matt riddle to regain the television championship and uh it was quite the post match involving matt riddle if you if you saw it i mean <laughs> zach won this and dude matt riddle pops up he's just like slapping hands on the way back i mean it was quite something to watch here um, I'll, I'll also say like, I didn't really explain, I mean, I, I kind of got the sense from the Jack Perry thing that like he was on his way out of, out of New Japan Pro Wrestling and therefore like did the handshake with Shota Umino and was slapping fan, like high five with the fans on his way out. I, uh, even if you're leaving New Japan, I, I wouldn't have done that. Like I felt like he, you know, kind of cooled off like some of that heat a little bit. Um, and maybe that was something that Matt Riddle was was thinking about as well. Uh, I I mean, do you get the sense that he's he's continuing or 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 what what from Matt Riddle? Yeah. Um. Well, it's it's been it's been noted he does still have some more dates. Although we're gonna get into this uh, the, the Dontaku lineups. Like he's not part of these Dontaku shows coming up in or well at least of of the matches that have been announced uh, so far. But yeah, you it was a very abrupt title title switch. So I I don't know if his days are numbered in in new japan but um you know at least you know the observer is reporting that he does still have several more dates with new japan uh resurgence is next month may 11th in ontario california and like overall i i really enjoyed this windy city riot card i watched the entire thing on uh friday night and saturday morning and what it felt like was one of the old like madison square garden cards that 
they would run monthly and throughout the show they're building up to the next month's show and setting up angles setting up matches they drew a great crowd it was an uh, like heated crowd for most of the matches the uh the stephanie vakura match i thought delivered in a big way like up and down i i just thought this was a really like great show from um new japan and again not just a show that was great on its own like they they cut a lot of angles and you could just follow this product and come back next month if you if you so choose like this is not even necessarily like you have to be following every single japanese show uh, from new japan either um they set up a lot for may 11th and they drew a, they did a great number here in chicago mm. So that takes us over to some of the match announcements from New Japan. So they will be running in uh, Hiroshima on April 27th. That'll feature the strong open weight tag champions, the new champions, Shane Hayes and Mikey Nichols, defending against El Fantasmo and Hikuleo, and Way's favorite, the King of Pro Wrestling Championship, as Great Okan defends against Yuya Uemura, stipulations to be determined. But then the big shows on the next tour are May 3rd and 4th in Fukuoka, the first night will include Nick Nemeth against Hiroshi Tanahashi for the IWGP Global Championship, Zack Sabre Jr. against Jeff Cobb for the television title, Yoda Suji against David Finley, and John Moxley will be working both nights in Fukuoka, the first night teaming with El Desperado and Shota Umino, unfortunately against Evil, uh, Ren Narita, and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. And then the second night features Moxley's first title defense against Ren Narita, Shingo Takagi against Gabe Kidd for the Never Openweight Championship, Hiroki Goto and Yoshihashi defending the tag titles against Kenta and Chase Owens, and then Tanahashi and Nick Nemeth one night after their title match team against Sonata and Taichi. So the key stuff there being uh, John Moxley on both nights and, you know, seeing um you know what, what we we skipped over that but the idea of taking the title off of Naito onto Moxley um did you like this move and do do you see this being one that is uh prolonged at least that Moxley I, I would think most see him keeping this at least through Forbidden Door yeah I would say so I I, I think it was a a really positive unexpected result from New Japan Pro Wrestling maybe some people expected it but maybe because of you know his association with AEW and what has to be assumed will be more of a part-time presence than your typical you know uh, IWGP champion um I was probably not expecting it um but I think it's a great shot in the arm for a a New Japan Pro Wrestling you know we're talking about maybe our excitement coming out of Windy City Ride and I can't say I felt that you know just even based off of a lineup um for any new japan proper cards in quite a while and and it just kind of it, it's because the, the roster is a lot more varied and um sort of like exciting than you know this this new japan um proper core that i feel like i've seen different combinations of so often so getting a moxley in there um as you know your top dog um, with a more sort of like, um, I don't know, frequent presence to me makes, makes me a lot, a bit more interested in new Japan. And, and looks like he's going to work with all like your, your rising stars, like Ren Narita is the first one they've already set up. Eventually he'll defend against Shota Umino. Mm -hmm. And you, you would just think naturally that a, um, Yoda Suji may be in there as well. Like it feels like this run is going to be everything we had sort of hoped that they would have done with Okada of having that one key loss um, at, at the end of this. And you could keep this belt on Moxley for some time. And I think you have to look at Saturday's success and John Moxley being the key reason for that show drawing so well. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally feel that way. Um, so yeah, it remains to be seen like how how often Moxley will, will appear on AEW. Um, but thankfully, AEW like, is in a position where I don't know if they necessarily need John Moxley. You know. And if he's doing like Dontaku and then he does Dominion in June and then like you just need to be doing the big shows. It's not like this guy has to be going and doing the like the road to shows or anything like that. No one would expect that. But if you could send him over once a month, this guy can certainly do that schedule. It's a very long flight. Well, I mean, this is a guy that I mean, he, he likes to travel. Maybe he'll play Sud Sudoku or something. Maybe he will be ordering Wrestle Universe to catch up once Marigold Dream Star Fighting debuts. This is the new promotion led by Rossi Ogawa with a press conference early Monday morning. And among the talents that they unveiled included Julia, Utami Hayashida, Mirai, Mai Sakurai, who is now going as Sakurai Mai, Victoria Yuzuki, Nane Takahashi, 
and uh, several others, including um, a contingent from Actres Girls led by Fuka Kakimoto, which has set up uh, or at least led to uh, some controversy with a statement put out by Actres Girls about um, uh, what, what looks to be like they were somewhat blindsided uh, by this a- as well. Um, there's certainly a lot of politics involved in all of this. The key news is that their first show for the new promotion will be May 20th at Cork and Hall with Julia and a mystery partner against uh, Sare, formerly of NXT, and a mystery partner of her own. And it's going to be broadcast on Wrestle Universe in both English and Japanese. So you can see the uh, connection right off the bat uh, with, with, with Cyber Agent. And the fact that they're going to have English commentary is going to be a very strong... Um, introduction for i think a north american fan base that might want to seek out these first couple of shows and an easy entry point and then they're going to be doing you know about seven to eight shows per month um with all of their dates listed that we have up on the site and they even did an angle today on on the noah card setting up a eight woman tag for their pay-per-view that's happening may the 4th so a lot of information that was uh given out at the press conference and i'll get the plug in now that wednesday the number one guest that I would like to have on to talk about this, Karen Peterson, will be on with myself and Brandon Thurston to talk about the significance of Marigold's launch, um, a lot of the details involved, and the key players. So uh, if you want to hear more about that, we will speak with Karen on Wednesday show. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, th- this to me felt like, you know, um, maybe top story of the day, at least you know, when I woke up this morning at 5 a.m. Um, I... I'm. I, I guess I'm. I'm. I'm impressed at the association with Russell Universe. I think it's a really smart one. Um, they're not asking like if you're a consumer of some of these products. It's not like they're introducing a standalone service that's another sign up for you. And and it it just continues to tell me like why can't like Bushi Road get their ducks in a row to to put stardom on the same service as New Japan Pro Wrestling. You know, the the hurdles that you're already asking people to sign on for a separate um, uh, service to figure out like the even the English in order to even do that has to me really limited stardom's growth in the US. And, you know, it's not like maybe Wrestle Universe is the most popular wrestling service that's out there. But um, I because of the value that it presents in giving you, you know, Noah and DDT and Tokyo Joshi Pro, this just feels that much more attractive and, you know, uh, presents at least an easy way for people to latch onto this new promotion from day one. Yeah, I, I I'm very curious to see, like, the level of interest that like this will be. It's interesting that week that week because you're gonna have two pretty big women's shows that are not um, that are not stardom proper shows with with this show on the 20th and then the Hanakamura Memorial Show on uh, just a couple of days later on May 23rd as well. So there will be a lot going on that week. Again, Karen Peterson will be on Pollock and Thurston this coming Wednesday. Uh, we're gonna skip on over to a couple of uh, notes coming out of UFC 300. Uh, Wade, did you hear anything about UFC 300? Did this reach your your orbit over the weekend? I saw um, people such as yourself and many others rave about the uh, Max Holloway knockout, and I did seek that out. Yes. Well, this, this was one of the best UFC cards in history. In terms of a live gate, it was their third biggest in history, $16.5 million at the T-Mobile Arena. And yeah, the big um, moment, if I would have to isolate one, was... Uh, Max Holloway finishing Justin Gaethje with a second to go in their five round fight where Max Holloway comfortably ahead on the scorecards and he just invites Justin Gaethje into the center to throw and he put Justin Gaethje to sleep with this right hand does the face plant onto the canvas it was as extraordinary of a finish as you are going to see like going through some of the most like all time finishes to UFC fights like you can make a, a short list. And I think you can make a real strong argument that this might might be the, the greatest um, with the benefit of time that people will look back on uh, as opposed to recency bias. But this was just a spectacular show. And then afterwards, they did confirm Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler for UFC 303 happening on June the 29th at the International Fight Week card. And this will be taking place at welterweight. This will be McGregor's first fight since July of 2021. And uh, Michael Chandler, who has just waited and waited and waited for this fight, he's finally going to get it, uh, knock on wood, that this fight does not fall apart for other unforeseen reasons. But as of now, there is a poster, there's a date, and there is a official announcement from the UFC. So Michael Chandler, he's finally 
he's he's within closing distance of getting this fight way will there be a follow-up wwe raw appearance from uh, michael chandler so it was the most interesting thing the fact that we got this that was so um like the most like over the top of this cross promotion and i'm really curious what the internal reaction was to this because <laughs> did, did michael chandler ruin it for the rest of the year well i'm just stating wait like aren't you a bit surprised now that wrestlemania and ufc 300 are in the books and the amount of cross promotion was like that reached my like orbit was like a tweet from paul levesque on saturday about ufc 300 like mm -hmm. they did not rely on each other's uh, avenues to promote their biggest events of the year and both were ultra successful shows um so it, it's not as though i'd be looking at it as a opportunity lost but more so an interesting insight i don't think you have to be too cryptic to read the lines from between the lines of dana white who consistently says that you know they're in their lane we're in ours like i i do not think that dana white is seeking a whole lot of what he might deem as confusion between the two products and wanting us to be we're under the same umbrella but we are separate entities i i feel um i i wonder if star power might be a, a part of it you know and i think having a connor who's the biggest star in the entire company w would be the biggest test um if wwe is presented with an opportunity to showcase him i i believe that they would simply because he's a big celebrity um so we'll see if they play that card and they also announced that uh, joining Frankie Edgar, Vanderlei Silva, and Joanna Janjacek into the Hall of Fame, into the fight wing, will be the first fight between Anderson Silva and Chael Sonnen from UFC 117 in August of 2010. Yes, we're nearly 14 years removed oh. from that fight, which in itself had one of the all-time great finishes to a fight when it was uh, kind of the opposite of Holloway and Gaethje, where not only was it a submission ending, but it was Silva who was down on the cards and coming back to submit Chael Sonnen, who stated years later that the fact he thought he was signaling the end of the round. He didn't realize that tap <laughs> was signaling the end of a fight. But if you are curious about this fight, uh, I did an audio documentary on this to mark the 10-year anniversary of Silva versus Sonnen. Being that this fight took place in 2010, the 10-year anniversary would have been 10 years later that this came out in 2020. That's how mm. anniversaries work. Uh, can you imagine if WWE had been promoting Saturday's fight, it would have been the 300th anniversary of the UFC? Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll go check that out. Last notes here, SmackDown on Friday, 2,499,000 viewers and a 0.76, not too far off last week's big numbers that they did. And Rampage doing 295,000 viewers and a 0 0.08, um, still very much at the low end of Rampage, but up 11% in viewership from the week prior on a weekend that had so much AEW programming between uh, Rampage on Friday and then three hours on Saturday night. And this weekend, they're going to have Rampage airing in addition to Collision on Saturday night because now we are into playoff season. So Rampage looks like it's going to be all over the place, but at least for this Saturday, it's another three hour block on Saturday night, same night as TNA Rebellion and the same night as uh, we are going to be preparing for an arduous task, which is the CN Tower climb, followed by like a five hour pay per view that night. Mm. What a weekend. Yep. Uh, this is what you signed up for. That is it. All right. You can go to postwrestling.com. Coming up later this week, the Ask Away Mailbag Show on Thursday. You can get your questions in on the Post Wrestling Forum thread, forum.postwrestling.com, or send us an audio question. We can hear your voice on the show. Free to enter memo.fm slash postwrestling. So tune in on Thursday, postwrestlingcafe.com. Multiple shows this week. Rewind to SmackDown, Collision Course. Lots of great stuff coming the your NWA, way. The NWA podcast. <laughs> Only five hours. Come on, guys. Pick up the slack, okay? What they, am I going to do for, for the, you know, on, on fr a Friday, uh, Friday afternoon? By the time they they went longer than either night of WrestleMania this year. <laughs> Not quite the length of UFC 300, but I feel before the end of the year, they, they might hit seven and a half hours. Yes, yes, perhaps. Uh, but if there was a five-hour show, th this this month I think warranted it. Uh, not only did they talk about Cody Rhodes, Devontae himself finishing the story, uh, they spent a really, really 
great great amount of time talking about the CM Punk uh, Jack Perry saga. And if I'm gonna make any room to hear anybody else talk about this thing, it's going to be uh, the NWA podcast, along with a whole other list of topics. So go download that right now. Just scroll beneath this this podcast and t- on the free feed. Yes, goes well with a uh, jar of pickles. So check out the NWA podcast from Sunday night. On to Raw we go, unless you wanted to chat about the Rick Ross-Drake feud that's going on. I'm actually trying to keep up with it. I, I am I, too. I mean, this stuff is moving so fast, I, I don't even know exactly what's going on. What so do you Rick, know? Well, I just saw the Rick Ross dropped his diss track free tonight. Ooh, tonight. Yes. Okay. So, so I did Ra- listen to so it. So Raw is going to take a hit, you think, from... Well, there, there's definitely going to be a dip when, you know, the, this dropped. And I think people realizing it when it was uh, showing, like he put it on all free platforms and wow. yeah, um, um, I, I, I would, I would say like, I, I listened to it. I I'd give it a good, like 10, 10, nine Rick Ross. I don't think this was 10, eight territory, 10, nine Rick Ross. Okay. Now, did, did you hear the, did you listen to the prior rounds? Did, like, did you hear anything? No, I've been going this? backwards and trying to piece this together. I'm up to like the text messages with his mother. Oh wow! I didn't realize that there were text messages. Okay, okay. Uh, I I I need to k- catch up on this, but okay. it's it's like to me, like I, I I love a good rap beef. You know, it's it's everybody likes the you know a good fight. Um, everybody likes seeing backstage footage of you know uh, fights. You say Rick Ross, you've got my attention. Okay, he yeah. is he is the draw for me. Yeah, uh, I mean, I feel like this this might uh, spark a new you know a new interest in 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 rap. Is it, is, isn't isn't life about uh, you know um, combat and 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 hatred and creating art out of that hatred? Isn't that why we're all here? Do you know how much could have been settled if like CM Punk and Hangman Page decided? You know what? Let's let's take this to Spotify. Uh, yeah, I would. I I think the diss tracks to come out of that would would be equal parts um amazing and horrifying. You know, yes. Okay. Well, you can you can give us an update maybe later this week once you catch up on on how everything is uh, shaping up, and maybe you can sure. declare um, a winner and a loser without any kind of Toronto area bias. Oh, that's hard for me to do. Okay. So, okay. Well, tonight we were in Canada, in Montreal, Quebec. WrestleTix announcing eight uh, eleven thousand eight hundred and thirty seven, which would be. B- below sellout level for the Bell Center, even yeah, with- they did not announce it tonight. They announced a number, but they did not ever claim a sellout. To the best of my knowledge, they announced a number of fifteen thousand one eighteen. Which, um, you know, it seems like they're doing some enhancement, but not a crazy amount. Is I- it possible that that the amount of people that work there, the comps, could add up to whatever numbers that they're promoting? And if they were at eleven thousand nine hundred. By like late afternoon, I I, I don't so, think so. WrestleTix uh, la- at last check um, at seven thirty, I believe, had it at about thirteen eight. Oh really? Okay, mm-hmm. then I don't have the updated number. Okay, well then that's. I mean, we're still talking about that. That's an incredible number for TV at at, at this. Point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Eleven eight. So I guess maybe what you had. Okay. Wow, that is a, actually a big jump. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that so was. Ha- announced- is the streak over? Has I think it. Over? I think it's officially over tonight. Yes. Uh, wow. I mean, the, the what a if you're a what nitpicker, a it ended with Raleigh. But I think we 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 give that one. That was really just okay. a couple hundred. Uh, but this one would seem to be the official end of the sellout streak, and we can put to rest the uh, the graphics package that they uh that they they certainly had a a, a good run out of. Who would have thought Montreal would be the, the the town to break the streak? I mean, it's a really big arena for one. Uh, so aren't they all? Um. Uh, there are, but uh, I mean, Bell Center especially. So um, I don't know. May- maybe they will come back and, and claim this. They could just continue and just make the sellout streak continue. I mean, what it doesn't have to be the truth. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, people like you will will, will start to prod at it, and, and I think it will we'll keep them honest. Well, starting off the show, Adam Pierce is in the ring and brings out Rhea Ripley, and she comes out in a sling. Uh, with her right arm uh, being in the sling. And they show the attack last week by Liv Morgan and state that she is going to be on the bench for quite a few months, and she has been told to vacate the title. And there are a lot of boos to this, chance of bullshit, thank you, mommy. She blames Liv Morgan and her revenge tour, says she has no respect for Liv, and 
She blindsided her, and when Rhea comes back, she's coming for blood, and they'll have to lock me up in a Montreal jail once I get to live. And Morgan comes out, but they're both restrained by security, and they stop Rhea Ripley. So this this had been uh, discussed throughout the day about an injury that Rhea had been dealing with, and there had been some some photos online that had popped up of like some fan photos of her that appeared to be her in a sling, and this you know it it was called out later like a shoulder injury that she has um no specifics on the extent of the injury or even the length of time she's estimated to be out they just said a couple of quite a few months and obviously enough that they felt the need to get the title off her because i would say like even if this was going to be a two to three month thing i think they could have gotten away with it mm-hmm. this has to be a fairly long-term thing which it's always unfortunate the the timing of it I guess you look at the fact that at least she got two mania um, with this title, got a year run with this belt, and it's just business is on fire right now. Like there's never a great time to go down, but I mean, everyone is, um, you know, in this locker room right now, seeing the, the efforts that are translating to business at the moment. And Rhea has become like from year to year, I mean, has made a gigantic leap as a star. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Injuries are, are never, ever good, um, you know, because they hurt, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, they, they take a lot of time away from your career. And often in this business, if you're not on TV, you start to become irrelevant. But there are better timed injuries than others. And um, sometimes they can only serve to make somebody who's already a star into an even bigger star. And I think that's the case here with Rhea Ripley. You know, she's had several major star making milestones over the past few months. You mentioned Mania. She also headlined that Perth show. Yeah. In her home country, felt like the biggest thing in the, in the entire country for one evening. Like uh, this timing could have been worse if this happened, worse. like, you know, around the time of like Punk's injury, for instance, like back in January. Yep. Um, got, got, you know, got on the video game and just really not to mention, like felt like a constant presence, you know, on, on the show, even without defending the championship, just as part of the judgment day. So she, this is essentially like the capping off, a, like an incredible year where she's already achieved so much. And it kind of has already gone through like a bit of a coronation, you know, several times on, on the big stage. So I, it, it's almost like she's at the point now where you ask where do you go from here? You know, what could she do to top herself after winning at Perth, after winning at WrestleMania? And it almost feels like, hey, like this, this kind of is not the worst thing in the world to make people miss you, to, 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 you know, just be away from screen for a while and not, and also to, to heat up this feud with Liv Morgan. I mean, they, they have that history, of course, from, from Rhea injuring Liv, at least in storyline. Um, now this becomes that much hotter. You know, it, it, it's certainly, you hate to say it, but like great for Liv Morgan. I'm sure she feels bad about it in real life, but it, it greatly deepens her current character and they're already selling like a revenge tour t-shirt. Um, I think the only interesting question or for me is how the, the baby face heel dynamics are going to work. I mean, she still like sounded kind of heelish here, despite like this being a very baby face moment. And certainly like afterwards with Judgment Day, that being a very baby face moment. Um, she, if you ask certain people, you'll say they'll say she's already a baby face. So do they use this injury now and the comeback as a, as a way to just completely turn her? Or do they continue to let her operate in this sort of like gray area, allow her to be a heel when she needs to be? Will the crowd even want to boo her at any point after this? Not when she returns. Not when she returns. She's going to be a gigantic baby face when she comes back. So you either ride that or you like who knows what what the like how many months this is of where the Judgment Day pro like I'm sure this is throwing like a big change of plans to where they were going with the with the Judgment Day now that you have the title on Priest and um. You know, do you just keep this together and then do a full breakup when she comes back? Um, you know, it's it, it could be ma- many different uh, directions that they take, but she, guaranteed she's going to be a huge baby face upon return. And I would, yeah. if that's the reaction you get, I'd, I'd always say to just ride that that wave instead of fighting it. There's no need to. It opens up a new spot in in the division for somebody to take that spotlight. Um, so I, I, again, you never want to see somebody get injured. Um, especially like, I don't know how serious the injury is. Hopefully it's not something that will impact the rest of her career. Um, but as, in terms of like star making ability, like the, there presents some potential to make everybody a bigger star coming out of this. So does this mean Logan Paul is the only, um, champion who's retained, uh, um, I guess who held a, a championship prior to mania? 
the Kabuki Warriors. Right, who didn't defend. But didn't defend them, no. Technically, no. yes, they are also champions. So of, of ones who defended their belts um, coming out, I, I guess that's the only one. Yeah, yeah. So really, it's like a reshuffling of the deck, at least, you know, uh, when, when we're speaking of champions for post-WrestleMania. Backstage, Rhea Ripley is with the Judgment Day. They give her a hug, and Priest says that they know she'll be even more of a badass when she returns, and... She just like says her goodbyes and then like walks off into the into the Montreal night. Just like walks home. She's not gonna stick around for the rest of the show. No, no, she came all the way. She's she's not sticking around for anything more. So yeah, mm. the pro- probably the last like this is not one where I think they're gonna be like punk finding ways to just bring her out. Like this seems like you know they'll probably just keep her off of television until they're ready to do the return. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sheamus. Speaking of those that had been out for quite a while, Sheamus has not had a match since the Toronto match with Edge last August. So he is out to his old theme music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it starts with I think the, uh, the the intro to the fight night thing, and then gets into um, Lobster Head too many lines. Yes, which uh, given the assignments, uh, Michael Cole does not have to scream this at least until the draft, uh, and then I hope that they pair Michael Cole, who has to scream that again. Uh, so they also note his opponent is Ivar, who made his main roster debut in this very building five years ago to the day, which is a crazy coincidence. Uh, interesting. Same arena, same day. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so Seamus. <laughs> it's kind of cool to him, I guess. It's the fifth anniversary of his call-up. Yeah. Sheamus hits the white noise off the turnbuckle. We go through a commercial break, and then uh, Ivar does a reverse off the middle rope into a knee, and then Sheamus pulls down his knee pad, and it is noted that this is the kneecap. Mm-hmm. He calls this the kneecap, Michael Cole informs us. So he drills Ivar, and then the brogue kick is... Uh, I think we all call it a kneecap. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I was like, what's what's like the play on words here? Yeah. <laughs> like it's a knee- kneecap <laughs> uh kneecap. and he hits the brogue huh. kick in eight minutes and 20 seconds there um, might be something obvious there that I, I, I mean we're just not seeing the kneecap uh I, I'm, unless i did not hear the proper pronunciation there's some pun in there. i heard kneecap too that's what i heard the knee, he calls this the kneecap and my thought was that's what i call mine <laughs> <laughs> does he spell cap a certain way uh that's irish i i don't i don't know we're going to get schooled on something here. But um, yeah, a fine return. Wouldn't say it was like some blow away. Like when, when I saw Seamus and Ivar, I was like, oh, wow, they're just going to cook here for like 15 minutes or something. Wouldn't say it reached that level, but um, he got a nice reaction for his return, which what consisted of one vignette last week that he's coming back. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, uh, in, in situations like this, I, I always think about, I mean, we don't know that much about the significance of, of Sheamus's injury. That, like, at least through reports, I felt like it was always kept kind of quiet. But we do know he was, what, out due to neck, neck issues. And you can never probably downplay any of that too much, you know? Um, like, what's was it at all career-threatening? And how important was simply coming back in, in like, a TV-ready match how important was that for for the performer here? You know, was this alone creating this sort of matchup with Ivar a, a major accomplishment for for Sheamus on his way back? That, that's something we don't necessarily know um, without knowing more about the performer himself. But I I, I mean I, I never discount that. There was a great video on Sami Zayn's win against Gunther that was narrated, and I mean one thing they did great on this show was just making Sami Zayn the star of the show in Montreal. It sounds obvious but i mean it's it's still sometimes remarkable when we're talking about the wwe product of um this option as opposed to uh well you know what i i should take that back because tonight they booked this all around the hometown star gave him the victory but you still went off the show with heat you were able to satisfy both both sides here i i had no issue with that i mean you need to there are times where you you need to finish the story and times where you need to set up the next story Adam Pierce is back and Paul Levesque is in the ring and they discuss that we now have two sets of tag champions. So they bring out awesome truth, huge reaction in particular for our truth. And Paul Levesque states that they need to represent a new era and the new era, like we've got it. We have got the memo loud and clear and I am really ready to let's 
Let's when do we down. when do we stop? Like when is it okay to to just calm calm down the new era? Yesterday it was enough time. I feel like you give them like a month. Oh my gosh. So they are now going to be identified as the world tag team champions and they show off the new belts. Uh Truth thinks that Paul Levesque is a magician and confuses him with Tommaso Ciampa. He has no idea this is Paul Levesque. And then Miz speaks French. That was to keep her, any baby face on the show. Just speak French. And the crowd loved this. And Pierce then announces, we're going to the triple threat match to determine your first set of contenders. Do you like mm-hmm. these new belts, which you're going to be shocked, are already available on WWEshop.com to buy? Oh, wow, goodness, yeah. I like them. I like them. They're more in line with the um, world championships, the men and women's sides um, on Raw currently. Uh, cur- well, I guess currently held by Damian Priest, formerly held by Rhea Ripley at this point. Um, seems to update them from the penny belt look that, or, or at what were they, I guess, um, pr- prior, like dime look. And uh, kind of the, the tag belts have had a rough run of looks. Mm. Yeah. Gets rid of like the the sort of raw and SmackDown naming conventions and uh, replaces them with the world um, sort of a, pr- a prefix. Th- though we've got the red here, and I'm sure we'll have the same belts but blue on Friday's presentation. Um, I'm I'm assuming on Friday you're gonna get new belts that look a bit more like um Cody Cody's belt. I would think. Um. Yeah, maybe. We'll so, see. so uh, I, I think it's cool. It just kind of, you know, organizes everything and reshapes everything under the Paul Levesque era. So, um, I'm, I'm also curious to, to know if they'll maybe refashion the U.S. and Intercontinental Championships in a similar way. Sure, we, you could always get new belts. Always new belts. Maybe every six yeah. months, new belts. Well, oh, at the rate that they sell them, I imagine that they would consider something. And like now that. they can sell the previous belts as collectors' items um is that how that works get your penny belt yeah Uh tag replica the creeds diy and new day and this is where i get to sit back and lean on way because the new day comes out and all of a sudden i get this qr code on my screen way and i totally missed that oh you missed this i totally missed the qr code damn oh okay you got you got to school me well it opens up this url um and it takes you to this like word puzzle um that thanks to uh brian from new jersey uh decoded this on our forum uh and then takes you to an image of this individual surrounded by black crows and a torch um it does this does this image am i missing something like is there any significance to this beyond what i described I mean, I have no clue. I, I, I was completely unaware of this. I, I stayed off uh, the, the, the internet, or yeah, the internet throughout all this. So I had no idea. So chat room, um, whatever you found, let us know. But I mean, clearly I would say building up to the Uncle Howdy return and also reports over this past weekend of Eric Rowan possibly coming in. So um, probably that. There are Pescados by DIY caught by the Creeds and a New Day hit uh, simultaneous Topic on Heroes to set up the break. Uh, there's a cra- there's a chant of Triple H at Ciampa, so he does the suck it su- sign. Woods elevates Ciampa for a Famouser by Kingston, but the Creeds come in. Multiple suplexes are traded. Brutus gets knocked off the buckle as Kingston stops the Brutus bomb. And then as Woods hits um, the elbow off the top, he goes for the cover and is hit with the meat in the middle. And they pin Woods in uh, 10 minutes, 33 seconds. So DIY, get the win. And this sets up next week on Raw with a tag title match against Miz and R-Truth. Really good match, I thought. You know, um, as soon as like somebody always hits a move, like they, they, they walk into another person delivering a move. And it, this thing, like it just kept going on and on and on. And so I think this t- tag division with this current, current crop, I mean, they're really impressing. And... Though the storytelling isn't really quite there yet, the star power isn't really quite there, I think the division is starting to build a reputation for delivering like strong, a faster paced style that, you know, um, you don't see elsewhere on the show. And um, that's worth something. So, you know, let, let's see how they deepen this uh, DIY and awesome truth feud heading into the uh, next. Well, shit, it's next week. Yeah, it's next Monday. Wow. Yeah. So they don't really have much time. No, no, this was the build up. Jackie is with Drew McIntyre, who watches the loss last week in the Fatal 4-Way due to CM Punk's involvement, and he's smiling, but then he kicks the TV monitor. Claymore is this TV and doesn't say a thing. And this was the extent of Drew McIntyre on the show. 
Yeah, he's angry. I wonder if he, he even traveled to Canada for this. Well, as um, as we did here through uh, CM Punk, you know, no one likes traveling up to Canada. It's uh, you know, it's it's a pain to get up here. I don't I don't blame anyone I here. Know, so I, I, I hope this guy was able to. Hey, you know what? Next week we're just going to tape this this week, and you can avoid the Canadian loop. Yeah, for his sake, I hope they did that. Um, yeah, kind kind of missed on the show. I'll be honest. Like I look forward to the Drew promo each week, which hmm. we did not have here, but they, they had uh plenty to fill on the show. Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell against Ivy Nile and Maxine. Uh, I will say this, Maxine, she was in there for a limited amount of time, but was fine. She hit a high cross and a fisherman suplex for a two count. They're not sending her out to do the like a Japanese ocean cycle cycle and suplex, but um, you know, did this fisherman fine. I thought it looked great. Yeah, I give her a lot of credit, you know, considering I would have expected them to pull her uh, off of TV by now. But, like, I think they're they're keeping her on the house shows. We we continue. Or, like, I guess, are they keeping her on the house shows? Because I remember us looking up her cage match and, like, it didn't look, look, look like she was that active. But then, of course, that whole incident happened with the fans shouting at her. Um, but they're keeping her consistent. And I think we're seeing signs of improvement. So i like to give her some credit there. Uh, I thought the fisherman suplex looked really great tonight. Yeah. Um, just looking at this, I mean, yeah, she's still on house shows. I mean, they're not great. like running a ton. Um, she did on, oh, I, I should correct that. She has done Raw's. Her last house shows were in February. Okay. So, well, I mean, they're not sense. running a ton of house shows, but more, more than that. So she hasn't been on any recent ones in the last month. Um, Anyway, she's at uh, 15 total, total matches. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. Candace uh, attacks Maxine, and then there's a DDT to LeRae, and she's searching for Ivy now. She goes to the wrong corner and then realizes she's crawling to the wrong one, makes the tag, but the ref misses it. So with the ref dealing with uh, Ivy Nile, Indy Hartwell nails Maxine with a cheap shot and places LeRae on top in 336. So... um not anything crazy, but we did have at least the progression that Indy is yeah. with Candice LeRae and their heels. The story is progressing, but it's it's moving very slowly at this point. And, and they, I, they dropped, like, the whole thing with the brother mm -hmm. was, like, that one promo, I don't know if they got cold feet or felt this was not the reaction we want to be courting, but, um, that, like, they haven't referenced it since the promo happened. I could see that being the case, you know, because it was certainly met with, with a bit of controversy. Some people feeling like it was tasteless or just kind of groan inducing. I, I guess, um, I, I might even prefer that to what this is, which has been nothing. They have not replaced it with anything of substance. You know, it, it, it's now just unfortunately kind of devolved into like a very generic and predictable, like slow heel turn for Indy car, Indy Hartwell. And, uh, Candice, you know, had just is just kind of like not really, you know, elevated or, or, or evolved since those initial, you know, heel um, tendencies. So maybe they'll pick up now, now that Indy has like joined the dark side. Um, but I'm waiting for this thing to be a bit more interesting because it's taken a long time to just even get to this point. They did this great video on Damian Priest uh, winning the championship, showing him in like kind of mainstream settings and promoting him as the first Puerto Rican world champion in over 50 years since uh, Pedro Morales. So uh, they had some very good video packages on this show between the, the Sami Zayn one earlier, this Damian Priest one. And in the back, Priest says, hey, we still run WWE. Dominic's going to teach Andrade a lesson. JD, you have his back. And Balor wants them to focus on winning back the tag titles. And I'm waiting for Priest to I mean, this is where this is building. It's like, listen, man, I've got larger priorities now. I don't need those tag belts. Do you see those redesigns? And uh, he tells Balor to, you know, you've got Jey Uso tonight, so get motivated. Balor's like, cool, I'm motivated. This was pretty interesting. I mean, they're clearly teasing some potential conflict here between Balor yep. and Priest. And Priest, Priest, you know, even Rhea probably hasn't even packed her bags and left the building yet. And the man's already taken over as full-on leader of the Judgment Day. So um, he's kind of pushing his weight around and uh, almost like, you know, we'll see later on, it, it will be in somewhat uh, disagreement about the Judgment Day's activity. So I, um, this is all kind of, you know, becoming the next chapter of the Judgment Day already. Earlier in the day, Chad Gable is working out with the Creeds in the ring and Jackie gets a moment with Chad Gable, who I don't know if he was trying to do the most like generic athlete interview but if that was the goal he accomplished it here i mean he 
reminded me of like speaking to a fighter who just the last person they want to be talking to is you. And this was Chad Gable. And he's like, you know, um, this match is everything. It's a uh, validation for uh, 10 years in WWE. And Jackie brings up. He, there was some substance here. He, he was talking about fighting in en- enemy territory when he was. Yeah, th- this was a good comparison. He was asked yeah. about the, the atmosphere. He said, listen, when I qualified for the Olympics, I was a guy from Minnesota and I had to fight in Iowa. And he's like, you know what that means? I was like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure many people here in Montreal know about the Iowa Minnesota rivalry, um, but he's going to expose Sami Zayn tonight. I overall like, I like this as they were trying to promote this as like this big like athletic showdown between these two. Like that's how this was promoted, like throughout the the show. That's how Chad Gable should be promoted. You know, he he's an Olympian. They're promoting this as if he was an athlete, giving an athlete, like athlete style promo, complete with like just I think athlete style presentation, interviewing somebody while they're in training, while they're going back to training. So, if for people that are looking for sports like presentation, I, I thought this was a great example of it. Andrade against Dominic Mysterio. Andrade starts with the three amigos and then delivers the double knees into the corner. And then they go to the apron and Dominic hits, as Pat McAfee calls it, this country destroyer. <laughs> Pat had some like good lines on this show. And clearly the man has at least um, had some experience of the French language. I'm not going to say it's extensive, but it was just enough to be entertaining as he tried really to acclimate himself to the French language audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this many months into the Pat McAfee second run, I think he's definitely more than caught up with all the storylines at this point. And um, feels well, very there, there was that one moment where he thought that, you know, Sami Zayn was trying to win the Intercontinental title tonight. So, I mean, <laughs> well, that... he was corrected by Cole that, no, he would be retaining the tag title. And yeah. Pat just cuts him off. He's like, when the match starts, no one is champion. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay that's a funny save that's a good save yeah. we're we're all prone to making mistakes as uh as i'm sure you know john um i i, I i'm enjoying pat like sometimes he could be, be a bit too much in a little bit grading but that's all kind of dependent on taste and i i think for the level of star power like they're getting exactly what they want out of pat so he hits the uh this country destroyer on the edge and rolls him in for a two count and this sets up andrade for a 619 but it's stopped with the spinning elbow and he hits the message in eight minutes and 39 seconds yeah the message the message i don't know Uh, about that name the message uh, he hit the message would you rather have a move called the message or the the elbow um oh wait that's not this move that's not this move the back elbow is another move um yeah well, I'm just the... trying to make a comparison to the kneecap, okay? Would you, what, what's better, the message or, or the kneecap? <laughs> he hit him with the spin. The yeah. spin. <laughs> um, I didn't remember anything from this match beyond the Canadian Destroyer, which I was, I was somewhat surprised that they put that spot in, in the middle. Like, it well, does tell... Why? Because it's, it's not like their MO to do stuff like Even this. Even Vince like... allowed the Canadian Destroyer. On like the edge of the apron for like just a nothing moment in the in the middle of the match, like well, it does are, tell you like a different. A, we're in a new era. Yeah, I, don't know if I, I think that's very evident. JD then jumps Andrade, and Pat is disgusted, calls him this little rat bastard as they're attacking him two on one. When Ricochet runs out to make the save to back up Andrade. Yeah, Ricochet isn't really doing much anyway. He kind of has a loose feud with the Judgment Day that I think the Judgment Day have already forgotten about, but um, Ricochet needs something to do, so uh, jump in here. Get involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you kind of have Andrade and Ricochet just looking. They're they're free. They've got stuff to do, so you might as well do it together. I guess speed only takes up so much of your day. Oh, the program speed? Yeah, no, not the drug, no. Kathy Kelly interviews Jey Uso and asks him to react to Tama Tonga's arrival on SmackDown. And he says the bloodline's going down a dark path and about Jimmy. I told him to join me, but I got to focus on Finn Balor. So we are already uh, teasing maybe a long, a long road to redemption for one Jimmy Uso at some point. Mm, Yeah. Well, they definitely have to redeem both of them themselves after uh, that match at WrestleMania. Have you seen the clip that's been circulating of like Jimmy <laughs> mid match? <laughs> no. Yelling for his daughter to get off her phone <laughs> and watch what? the match. Yeah. In he, the ring? It, while he's in the corner, like in the middle of the match, he's like yelling at his daughter, get off your phone. 
watch watch daddy oh my god <laughs> it's so funny even oh. his daughter was i mean i don't know it was not a great match she was maybe watching the basketball game yeah. well that's <laughs> yes. that's funny who would do that at a, at a wrestling show chelsea green and piper niven versus katana chance and caden carter uh we had the double knees to green in the corner for chance and carter um Carter hits a leg drop onto Green, and then Niven's in with a running cross body. Um, there was a spot where where Chance leaped off the back, um, off of Green's back, who's being held by Carter to be caught by Niven. Uh, but then after Niven hit the running cross body, Green rolls up Carter in two minutes and fifteen seconds. Yeah, probably the shortest match on the show, would, right? I, I mean, all of these women's matches we had. I mean, the the last women, the other tag was three and a half minutes. Okay, I mean it's yeah. uh. You know. Well, listen, a lot of stuff to cram in here. Um, a, a lot of big talking segments, okay? Just because Dwayne Johnson isn't around doesn't mean you're, uh, the women's tag team division is getting more any uh, any more airtime for these matches. Um, Got to build up these challenges for the Kabuki Warriors. I guess so. I don't I don't really know what the point of this was. I guess, are they rehabbing Piper and Chelsea after like they lost both? What, uh, Chelsea lost to Jade Cargill twice last week? Is that yes. the idea? Yeah, that's it. This okay. is the, re the rehabilitation process. So they recapped uh, Rhea Ripley vacating the title, and then Liv Morgan is interviewed, and Morgan doesn't understand why everyone's so mad at her. Where was this sympathy when Ripley took me out? It's not just an eye for an eye. It's a shoulder for a shoulder. What was Liv's have... injury? Do you remember? Liv, Liv did have... Uh, it was a shoulder injury that she had. Oh, my had. God. It's, it's like it's meant to be. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you do have a story here to, uh, to, to play up with, with some you know creative license. She says it's karma. And it's just the beginning because the end is me becoming champion. A good promo here from Liv Morgan. And if she gets mm -hmm. heat for this, then then run with it. Why not? No, well, she already has heat for this. I mean, Lean I think she, she was already very much, you know, leading towards like a Drew McIntyre, like a, a trajectory towards being a heel where her actions are perfectly logical for her. And it's just the rest of the world that's turned heel on her. Um, and she seemed to really convey that really well here in this particular promo. I, I'm continuing to love the new edge on Liv Morgan. And uh, uh, you know, a promo like this tells me that they know exactly how to parlay this very unfortunate injury from Rhea into something bigger for this character. Cody Rhodes comes out and he pushes the fact that, well, they promoted pretty significantly the two matches coming up for the third hour and making a big emphasis on those two. The crowd is singing Ole, they chant for Cody, so Cody speaks some French. Thanks Adam Pierce for allowing him to show up here on Raw since I'm a SmackDown performer now. But says he's not going anywhere. Well, like, yeah, you, you, you kind of are. You will, you will be going somewhere. Yeah, yeah, when the draft comes, I mean, you'll have to stay somewhere. Yeah, and and if we need a spike for attendance, guess what? I'm going to be here. So he says he's going to face either LA Knight or AJ Styles at Backlash. Thanks Seth Rollins again. Talks about The Rock's Instagram video that he posted and thinks The Rock has many matches left in him. And Rock said he's going to make me bleed again. Well, if I bleed, I'm going to make you bleed. Then he brought up Tamatonga. This was just like our This Week in WWE recap, hosted by our world champion. And then he calls out Jay Uso. And Rhodes says that, Jay, this is about to be your show. And just like you had my back at WrestleMania, I want to have your back tonight. And Jay's like, you know what? I'm good. Cody's like, you sure? Yeah. Okay. I'm leaving. And ends it with, until we yeet again. Yeah, which, I mean, I don't exactly know what yeeting means, but the, the way they've been kind of framing it, um, I I don't know. I don't know if you'd want to yeet with somebody. Um, you need you need dude wipes. Uh, very likely, yeah. So, oh. I, you the, know, the, I... Th this was just a, a segment to get Cody Rhodes on the show. There was not a whole lot to yeah. this. You're building up a SmackDown program for this month, and um, but hey, it's it's the major star, and they wanted to have him on the show. Well, that line, until we eat again, I mean, that does suggest a bit of finality in, in this relationship, don't you think? Like, it almost like it doesn't feel to me like they'll... I, I think they're going to eat again <laughs> on a Monday night very soon. soon. I do not see these two being too far apart for... Oh, goodness. I mean... Just a casual yeet. Aren't, aren't they going to be on the draft show together in a few weeks, you would think? I'm um, sure. Okay. I guess so. Okay. Kathy interviews Nia Jack. She doesn't care about Rhea Ripley and asks who is going to stop her from taking the title. There are two types of people in this world. Those that fear Nia Jax and those that learn to fear Nia Jax. The title is mine. Which are you? 
Uh, I I definitely learned to. F well, I fear. I fear. I'm both. I've I've. Feared I, I feared when she came back here, but you know what? I I think she's she's found a, a good role here. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I I think she's kind of like gone through the roster of like I guess relevant opponents on Raw. So the the draft will be really good for her. I think she's just a very useful character for any team of baby faces to you know uh, oppose. So, like, on SmackDown, the possibilities are out there. Obviously, the Jade Cargill interaction, I think, is is going to be the big one that we'll probably see at some point next year. Jay Uso against Finn Balor. Uh, Damian Priest is watching in the back, and Balor jumps him as his music is playing from behind, and the match begins. Balor yanks Jay off balance, and then Jay comes back, hits a Samoan drop, and then Damian Priest grabs his belt and leaves the backstage area, but not in time for the match to end because... After a sling blade, the shotgun dropkick gets stopped when Jay lands a super kick, misses the Uso splash, then Finn is up, hits the shotgun, goes for the coup de grace, misses, takes a spear and the Uso splash. Jay wins in nine minutes and 14 seconds, which um, is all this guy. This wasn't any spectacular match. It was just Jay getting a win over a semi-protected guy in Finn Balor to build up this match for Damian Priest. It was definitely the right result. Very straightforward and, you know, decisive, logical booking here to build Jay up. Um, I found it interesting in the post-match beatdown here. Were you about to recap this? I'm sorry. Well, Priest appears on the apron and holds up the belt when JD and Dominic jump Jay from behind. And Balor joins in and Jay is able to super kick Dominic and then throws JD into Finn Balor and then runs through the crowd as... Balor, or sorry, as Jay Uso is compared to Max Holloway by Pat McAfee. Hmm. Um, well, I, I found it interesting that it was like Priest looked like he was not um, not approving of this sort of gang beatdown. He like didn't he, take part. Yeah. Well, like he wanted Jay either one on one. So I don't know if that's meant to. Well, obviously it's meant to maybe draw some again continued tension between Damien Priest and the rest of the Judgment Day. But are we, you know, at a point where like we're trying to see Damien Priest as more of a babyface who's noble and prefers a one on one fight? Um, that would probably make more sense, you know, turning Priest babyface and the uh, keeping the others heel. Well, we got the long following of Jay Uso through the crowd into the lobby as he's high-fiving with fans and one There's, fan tried to like step in his way to like you know dude, take a selfie this, this, this guy this guy's on his phone yeah and he's like walking in front of it as, as someone that's a, a fairly fast walker there's nothing worse than somebody that's like on their phone and they just stop it's like yeah. my world stops and everyone's gonna stop around me and jay just like moves this guy out of the way good for you <laughs> yeah i know got a good reaction like he yeeted this guy out of the way he got he he got the yeet scared out of him and he's out of the way and jay is just like marching to like leave the building and yeah. runs like into sammy's like where, where where was jay going listen okay in toronto it's 11 degrees it can't be that far off in montreal okay it's no temperature for a man who just had a wrestling match heart rate uh, risen up there to walk into the icy cold of montreal without a shirt on where is it where did this guy think he was going yeah this was one of those where I, I think everyone's going to be like, oh, my God, did you see this like continuous shot? It was so beautiful. I was like, th this is one of those examples where it's like, OK, you've got a fine idea here, but it's like we're really going out of our way to just do some of these like like we couldn't just like cut to this. We had to do the like wh where, where was Jay going after this? Was he leaving to not watch the main event? Was he maybe he's going to Le Cajo Sport? <laughs> maybe he's not allowed to cover it in the building and has to go across the street and uh <laughs> the casual sport oh my uh, god jokes for two um so yeah sammy explains um i came here for the first time 25 years ago to see my first wrestling show and i'm entering the building the same way i did those 25 years ago mind you no ticket here shows up just for the main event like total casual and walks in uh, what I will say here, this was one of the best entrances I can recall on an episode of Raw because he yeah. walks through these fans that probably were just like, man, we just ran into one of the Usos. I don't know which one it was, but he just came by. And then Sami Zayn walks by. They're losing their mind. And then he walks into the arena. And dude, it is so loud. You can almost like you can barely make out his theme 
it's so loud as he makes this entrance. This was a tremendous idea that they had for him to enter. And he's just and we going. Have, we have to thank Jay Uso for leading the cameraman all the way outside. I, had he not, Sammy would have been out there for the whole third hour. Like, how would he have yeah. even known when the match was going to start? So, like, he wouldn't have heard his music. Um, so, yeah, he's going all over the arena. It's not like he just darted for the ring. He went all over the place, got a Canadian flag. This place was going wild for him. I, I just thought this was excellent, this entrance. Yeah. Well, you and I were there um, in attendance for the last time he was in Montreal. And that was a very, very, very special moment. And clearly under this new era, under a new uh, director in Lee Fitting, they decided to, well, they anticipated it and they decided to get creative with how they were going to capture it. And, and you saw a lot of different angles of the crowd. Um, they, they really worked their ass off to make this feel that much more special. I don't know, like we've seen these, the shield entrances, you know, like, I don't know, throughout the entirety of professional wrestling. But I'd never felt like as kind of taken into the perspective of the performer actually going into through the crowd to the, as something like this. So uh, they did a great job. Maybe second best production I've seen all week, um, just next next to Coachella. I don't I don't know if you got to see any of that. Oh no, I was. Oh, it's very impressive the production these days. Was Taylor Swift just there as a fan at Coachella? Yeah, I, that I'm not aware of. Okay, but um, uh, yeah, no, the No Doubt performance was was great I oh i did hear about that I, I saw none of it but okay. okay next week they announced for columbus ohio a new women's champion will be crowned they didn't announce anything like not a tournament not a battle royal just a new champion will be crowned i wonder if they have figured out how they're crowning this like no people announced nothing yeah well you you have live you have naya at least saying that they want to be the women's champion so you have at least two people okay great <laughs> Awesome Truth against DIY for the tag titles and Ricochet and Andrade against Dominic Mysterio and JD McDonough. And before Chad Gable makes his entrance, Bronson Reed comes up and basically says, whoever wins is going to get me and won't be champion for long. So obviously where we are going, probably for backlash, although, man, they love to put their title matches on television. So who knows? Sami Zayn, Chad Gable for the IC title. Man, Michael Cole, busy on cage match, noting that Sami Zayn made his debut 22 years ago for FLQ. And Zayn does a flip off the top rope and lands on his feet. As Pat notes, nothing generic about that. And the two go nose to nose and we go to a commercial break. And to realize um, just how big this is, we are about seven minutes into this match. Pat McAfee scale, he has deemed this a six star instant classic. And I was like, I don't think we're going that high yet. But then we see who is ringside, the best second in the entire industry, Khadija. Oh. And there she is in the front row. Dude, Sami Zayn needs to have her on the like a travel budget for this company for all his big matches. She just needs to be ringside. She is great. <laughs> like her reactions to all of like the big the big spots when they did the Olympic slam off the top. I mean, it was just great. And Gable goes after the knee and he's working on it. Uh, Zayn did a really great job of, of selling this thing. They go through a second break and this is when the Olympic slam is hit off the top by Gable and Zayn tries for some rolling Germans. Gable reverses to land one and then we see these constant standing switches as both are trying to get the position on the other and it ends with Zayn lifting Gable and do drops him with a German on the back of his head and they showed this slow motion replay. Nuts. Just nuts. He tries for the Haluva, but it's stopped as Gable rolls for the ankle lock. Zane counters out of it. And then it's Gable coming off the top right into a power bomb in midair. And Zane calls for the sharpshooter. But as he goes to turn, he collapses and is clutching his ankle and can't deliver the sharpshooter. So Zane tries for a Haluva, but he can't run and is caught with a German into the turnbuckle. Back to the ankle lock goes Gable, but Zane breaks free and manages a exploder in the corner and is able to get up to hit one haluva, and that is enough for the victory in 17 minutes and 12 seconds as Sami Zayn retains. Uh, before we get to the angle afterward, uh, your thought on the match. A very good match, I thought. You know, Gable was just excellent controlling most of this match, and I thought Sami Zayn's selling was awesome. He, you know, had a very convincing limp throughout the entirety of the match, and I thought he made those haluva kicks feel like each of them were a struggle. Um, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, um, 
it was a TV match and not a pay-per-view level sort of like, you know, a grand bout that you think maybe these two might have an even better version of within them. But for a TV match, especially with the angle, knowing that this feud is going to continue, I thought it was very good and very appropriate. The atmosphere was great, I mm. thought, for the match. Like, like, very, very good. I would I would put it like right on par with the, their match they had on TV about a, a month ago, which that was like the unadvertised one with the with the gauntlet. But I mean, the atmosphere for this obviously blew it away. And there is Khadija. She's so happy seeing Sammy win. And Sammy goes over to hug his family members in the front row. And then from behind, you just see it's really tight on Sammy. And you see Gable just put his arms around him. And it's in so tight that you're almost thinking, is he just like lifting him up to celebrate or something? But no, it's in fact what you thought. And he Germans him right onto the floor. And look at this shot, Khadija putting out her arm. This is amazing. I did not see this. Uh, this is the best shot. And down goes Sammy. <laughs> this, this is just great. Look at his face. And then Gable posts him and applies an ankle lock through the turnbuckle with this low angle shot from the floor. So right it goes off of his with life. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there is Sammy screaming as the show ends. I thought this was a great angle to end, end the show with. And like, I think everyone was somewhat expecting the, the angle. But at the end, are you going to get it this week? Will it come at another time? And mm. I, th I thought they did it really effectively at the end. Gable is also such a strong baby face, like with with the story about his like uh, wanting to avenge his daughter against Gunther, that I I too wondered if they were going to execute the heel turn if they weren't going to do it at WrestleMania, um and clearly they they wanted to give Sami Zayn the big win on on that stage and are they, both their kids going to be in the front row for their rematch? Uh, well, Sami Zayn hasn't allowed his kid to sit ringside. Oh, that's right. Well, we yeah. did see him at WrestleMania, but he wasn't yeah. allowed to come out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, maybe they'll they'll sit in a room in, in the back and, you know, make faces at each maybe, other. Maybe know. Sammy says, you know, I didn't want my son to witness Gunther because he's a threat, but I'm going to let him be out there for you, Chad. Ooh, okay. I'm not too yeah. worried about what you have to bring. Oh, goodness. So, you know, um, I would say at this point, like all, everybody that wanted to see, uh, what is it, uh, Chad Gable be the one to end Gunther's reign, that's just over. And where do you go from here? You have Sammy feud with Chad Gable. And Sammy is clearly the baby face that they're going with. And I think maybe the, the right choice because he's the baby face with a lot more potential. He's the top baby face in, in, in Canada. He's the top baby face very likely in Saudi Arabia as well. I'm curious to see if, like, the French, you know, kind of adopt him as um, any sort of significant hometown guy. So internationally, Sami Zayn as a babyface is incredibly valuable. Um, but that doesn't mean Chad Gable can't have a significant role. And turning him heel completely refreshes the character. It makes him even more of a serious character than he was um, even in the past months. You know, pretty much completely divorced from his Alpha Academy um, role. So I'm imagining this is his defection from the group, or at least that'll come. Um, probably... I think they split them in the draft. I think just to have a clean break from I think Otis. he should attack them. I think he should beat Otis. Th there's up. something to that. Uh, like, I think Otis probably needs a refresh at this point of something, and the draft is a good excuse to get him on his own to do something new, whether it's with Maxine or separate. But mm -hmm. I, I think you split them. Um, the question is, how do you... Like this feels like the the match to go with, but you do have the Bronx and Reed. Um, I would I would be going to this. Um, Me but too. Maybe they're going to hold it off uh, for a bit because you do have the Bronson Reed match, and I I really don't like the three way idea for this. I don't either. I don't either. I think Reed is more of a TV match. It just doesn't feel that interesting to me. Um, but this has, you know, months of story at this point. So do they save it for Backlash or what's the other one? What's what's coming after Backlash? Saudi Arabia. Which okay. they've kind of made Zane into like a big part of those shows now. You can kind of justify either one. You know, if like I, I could even see Zane, well, probably not main eventing because Cody, I imagine, will be wrestling at Saudi with who knows. Um, but either one, I think, you know, will we'll, we'll, we'll do well. You realize if this was like two or three years ago, you know, between Gunther and Chad Gable, we would have tall G and shorty G. Wow. Probably, probably be a team. Doing a bunch of at comedy. this point, like, do you still see Shorty G when you look at Chad Gable? Um, he he's shed it, but I I can still see. Um, I I I I think that did a number on him. It was not just the Shorty G thing that was the worst, but uh, he's just been a, like 
in a comedy role for so long that I still mm-hmm. feel like they're I, I think he's he's gotten through that in a pretty significant way. But yeah, this is going to be etched in a lot of people's memories. Like this was just a God awful gimmick for the, for this guy. And sometimes it's, it's hard to shed that, but I mean, he's, this man has had to work years. This is the role. This guy should have been in for, for, for years, really going back to, um, you know, w- with him and Jason Jordan when they broke up. Yeah, I mean, I really hope, like, Chad Gable, you know, coming off of this character and this feud with Sammy, I hope he ultimately, at some point, does become world champion someday. If anything, for the reason that we get an A&E biography on him, and he can tell his his real thoughts about how he felt about this period of his career as Shorty G. Well, as long as he doesn't have an NDA, I think he will be uh, free to talk about his his handling in the in the in this company because he he got it really bad and yeah. it doesn't always get uh isolated as as one of the poor handlings of a, a really great performer and now you're getting to see him mm-hmm. all right let's go to some super chats if there are any to be sent in because we also have feedback on the forum we got some super chats here the first one here comes to us from richard young who sends five pounds thank you richard for the support here do you think vince selling all the stock might mean he is raising cash to jump back into the industry when his no compete is up he's crazy uh he is crazy i'm i'm gonna lean no on on, on that one i just i, I don't see there, there's so many reasons why i would say no the obvious being you know, I, I even hazard to say like the reputational harm that he has done upon himself because I find whenever I lean on that as a reason, I'm I'm left uh, let down by um, when someone has um, significant finances and a reputation like Vince McMahon, positive or negative in the business world, um, save from the the personal reputational harm. Um, I, I just don't feel it's something that he would have the ability to. I. I I think he'd have a, a struggle to be able to get viable television. I think he would get a television deal, but starting from scratch, I just, I, I really don't see it happening, but he will technically be free of a no compete as of next January. So if he wanted to, he has a lot of money, like he could burn a ton of money trying to do something and it would probably, it would probably fail um, unless he, you know, it's, it, you can't say completely zero. Who was his biggest um, link throughout the end of his TKO run that he helped UFC with? It was like in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia wanted to start a pro wrestling promotion tomorrow. And who would be their guy? It would probably Vince McMahon. I don't think they would have any moral hangups of working with a Vince McMahon. So you can't completely dismiss it. Um, I, I just see it highly unlikely. Mark those words. Okay. And listen, if if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But yeah. I, I, no, I, I I think it would be a really I, I just could not see it getting off, off the ground. Nor nor do I think you'd even be like the talent situation I think alone would be pretty yeah. pretty tough of people that yeah. are out there. I, I I'm leaning towards no as well, just because like I mean, how do you even come close to what you've built, you know, like in the WWE? Um I'm saying but, all this without any kind of federal indictment that is yeah. that is still thrown his way. Like we're talking mm-hmm. now of a guy who at least is just facing a civil suit it could be a lot worse. Um, and, and that could drop at any point. I suppose the only question I have is what does somebody at his age do with all that money? You know, I, I if you have the resources to do anything you want in, in this world, I imagine you would spend it on like what makes you happy. And I think what made Vince McMahon happiest was working on his wrestling show. So I, I for that reason, I, I, I mean, it wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world to for me to hear that he's the backer of, of one of these things, or at least, you know, kept his face away from it and is somewhat controlling it through somebody else. I don't know. But um. I I'm curious to know if he is looking to collect cash to, to spend it on something or because I also don't don't see him as somebody who's just who just decides to sit on cash. Well, who knows? Let's go to Jake from the Windy City who sends five bucks. Thank you, Jake, for the support and uh, for your recent chop dash teas purchase that you tweeted out um, taking advantage of the sale. Uh, by the way, um, NWA bundle currently on sale right now. If you buy the NWA T-shirt and the Yik youngest in charge Andrew, Andrew Thompson t-shirt you save like 17 bucks or something uh, and that goes for like hoodies and, and all that stuff too 
Jake says, you guys have seen Cody's big title wins at Mania and at the first All-In. How would you compare both as far as atmosphere, emotion, build-up, etc.? Way took a, way took a, took the exit on the on the the Cody big title win at WrestleMania. What? Oh, well, he's I saying mean, live. Being, yeah, I didn't see it live being at the building. Did I mean, you really I, see it live? I mean, or did you watch on a screen? No, because the second night they had the they had the it was like open air for the second night, so it was better than the first night. But I, I wouldn't. It, it's still when you're that much further away in a, in a box, it is a bit different. Um, I mean, I would state that, you know, the the Cody Nick Aldis match, like I was looking forward to it because the build was really sensational for that match. But man, it kind of like for mania this year, you knew what everything was built towards and what to expect. Like I did not expect Cody and Nick Aldis to get that level of a reaction in the building um, back at, at at the first all in. And it was it was to me like the, the standout match for me of of all in like there were mm -hmm. there were some better um bell to bell matches but for me like that was the memorable match of all in and it was the atmosphere it was the story that they had and it was it was just a great presentation overall i would i would yeah. definitely state though the wrestlemania one was just it, it was bigger just given the sheer amount of people you had a year delay on this whole thing which made it that much bigger um so, so you, you do have to go with this over the, uh, you know, the NWA title win with all due respect. Yeah, but both of them um, have in common uh, uh, stories related to Dusty Rhodes, his father, you know, and, and you can maybe say that like, oh, Cody like has a story built into all of his matches, you know, because he's the son of Dusty. But I think it also takes a tremendous talent to be able to turn his real life background into a compelling modern day story um and and cody has has just done like a great job of that in both of those instances and the build-up was great to both matches i thought overall yeah uh all right thank you guys for your super chats let's go uh up next, up next to forum.postwrestling.com marcus from tampa flipping between raw and the local tampa bay rays game and the wnba draft tonight uh, I thought this was a good episode. I'll try to keep my feedback short. I like the tag titles, and I'm glad WWE is getting away from the red belts because it's raw and blue belts because it's SmackDown and now and not simplified the designs. The one-shot transition from Jay exiting the arena to Sammy entering the match was amazing, and seeing the crowd shots for Sammy's entrance hooked me in for the title match. Thank you, Marcus, from Tampa. I just want to know an update on Jay. Where is he? <laughs> uh, maybe walking all the way back to um, to the U.S., did he maybe just quietly go back into the arena and apologize to that guy who he just shoved out of the way? Uh, who was probably uh, still st stuck on his phone and didn't even realize? That dude should probably be apologizing to him, I think. Uh, Get off to... your phone! <laughs> Watch gotta... the main event! <laughs> Manny from Pacoima. It, it begins again. Revel in what you are. They feel forgotten. Yes, I guess these are all things that... Uh... Or might be messaging um, attached to this Uncle Howdy stuff. These past few Raws have been flying by. Somewhere near the cliffs of Mo Moher. Neil Flanagan is celebrating for WWE once again. Has too many limes. Too many limes. The, Irish te the tease between the separation of Damien Priest continues as he's ignored F Finn's chase for the tag titles. As well as being upset that the Judgment Day jumped Jey Uso. Speaking of Jey, what a one shot. I've noticed the long backstage shots have mostly been centered around Sammy. Could be a coincidence or could be part of his presentation either way. They have to have Rey Mysterio bring out the Daredevil suit once again and re reenact one of the continuous fight scenes from Netflix's Daredevil. All right. I, I, I don't know about that one, but um, yeah, potentially. Andrew from Cape Breton. So a nerdy part of me came out while watching the show, so I hope you'll indulge me. In 2002, the WWE Tag Team Championships were introduced on SmackDown to be a counterpart to Raw's World Tag Team Championships, which were the old WWF tag titles that date back to the 70s. In 2010, Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre beat the Hart Dynasty for the unified tag titles, and after that point, they retired the World Tag Team title lineage and used the 2002 tag titles as the lineage going forward. This is when they introduced the Penny Belts as the new title design. In 16... When they had the new draft, the WWF, man, are, are you keeping track of this? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The WWE yeah. Tag Team Championship was renamed the Raw Tag Team Championship. And in 2024, in a full circle moment, the belts 
that were a counter to the World Tag Team titles have been renamed the World Tag Team titles. All of this detail can be double-checked if you're like me and interested in this dumb stuff. It sucks that Rhea Ripley is injured, but the silver lining is that the woman who injured her was on a path of revenge against her. If she's going to get injured and have to vacate the title, it was best to have it be at the hands of Liv Morgan. I also thought the main event was great tonight. If Vince was still around, Sammy would have dropped the belt tonight. So I guess this really is a new era. So I guess um, all that's just to maybe have me ask, like, what what exactly, uh, which of these tag team, like, does the current, do the current tag team titles have any ties towards the oldest WWE tag team title lineage? Uh, he was he was saying that one was discontinued. I, I couldn't give you right. an answer. Interesting. Okay, so I'm looking it up right now, uh, according to Wikipedia, the old... W World Tag Team Championship, like you know the the ones that we remember with like you know the Royal was Warriors. that discontinued in 2010? 2010, yeah. So, um, they pay attention to this stuff when it comes to you know the the big championship, like the World Championship, the Bob Backlund, uh, uh, you know Bruno Championship. But for the tag team titles, they clearly at some point <laughs> didn't give a shit and they just <laughs> cut out that lineage. W whatever, like it's you know. It's not like they treated these belts with that much respect over the past decade. All right, you're up. Okay, uh, we go up next to, um, who, who are we looking at here? Muggin, who says, the color coding of the tag titles are going bye-bye, and that's a good thing. I bet SmackDown will get the same deal, too. Rhea Ripley big hitting the women's world title and sitting out for a while does suck, but a best blessing came in disguise as a double turn happened with Liv taking credit for putting her on the shelf. Sheamus didn't miss a step, and he got his old theme back. Lee Fitting should get a killer gift basket for upgrading the production in three months that Kevin Dunn couldn't do in 30 years. Okay. Kevin Dunn deservedly gets a lot of shit, but if you're going to fault him for WWE's problems, you should credit him with the WWE successes. And WWE consistently has had some of the best production in not just professional wrestling, but all the sports, you know, throughout its its history. There were a lot so, of annoyances that people got that associated it with, with Kevin Dunn. And it's kind of like a Vince McMahon thing where it's like ultimately at the end of the day, like a production choice comes down to like, that's Kevin Dunn's uh, area. And you can get sick of like, you know, the, the zoom ins and, you know, certain things, but yeah, to what about the grandeur of the stage, you know, uh, of the Titan Tron being introduced or, uh, I, I mean, just, you know, the, the, the long shot from, from, uh, the, the bean gene, you know, interview spot. Like, these are things that I, I think if you're going to, again, credit the guy for his faults, you should commend him for things he's added to the production as well. Anyway, uh, let's go to Muggin, who said, or, or Muggin continues to say, Sami Zayn and Chad Gable stole this episode with a fantastic TV match. The tracking shot of Sami walking through the Bell Center was the illest thing I've ever seen. Does anyone think the women's world title will be decided in a tournament or a battle royal? One of these moves is lazier than the other. I'm guessing tournament. What do you think? Could it be a one night, though? In tournament? one night? Um... With how many people? Two. <laughs> a two-woman uh, tournament? That's whatever. called a match. Four. Uh, four okay. at most. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's going to be probably one or the other unless they have some, like, gauntlet match or, uh, I mean, they can come up with whatever they want, but I don't know. The fact they didn't announce it tells me, like, maybe they don't have, like, a clear idea yet. Uh, Ani writes, I'm almost certain WrestleMania 40 was the peak of the Triple H regime, the culmination of the perfect chase with the right baby face, heel, and the set of circumstances led to a blow-off that people will hold dear for some time. Even if they never scale those heights again, the last hour of Raw or so showed that there are still some interesting things that might be worth sticking around for. So the new era is in, in the rearview mirror for, uh, for Ani here. He's uh, mm -hmm. like, you know what? We hit, we hit the high, and now there's only one, one direction to go. This is a tricky part of the, the season where, I mean, you, you're the WrestleMania hangover where you've just culminated all of these long storylines and you're you're starting at chapter one for a lot of these new ones. Um, so, you know, give them space. I mean, this is also before the draft where, like, you're really getting the start of all of these new stories. So let's go to, lastly, Matt from Montreal who says, just came back from the Bell Center. Loud crowd as usual. I really enjoyed the show, but I was a little disappointed not seeing Drew. I was just a bit higher off the hard cam, so you didn't see my perfectly fine post-wrestling sign. I love you guys. Also, everybody cheer for Jay pushing that stupid cell phone guy. Yes. Um, you know, Matt, if, o if, if only you could have gotten in Jay Uso's way with your <laughs> post-wrestling sign. <laughs> perfectly fine. That would have been great. Great sign, Matt. That's great. Thank you, Matt, so much for that. And thanks to all of you for your feedback tonight and Super Chats. 
Again, we are back later this week. So we've got uh, up next coming up on Tuesday night with Braden and Davey. Wednesday, Pollock and Thurston featuring the great Karen Peterson. And then Wednesday night, we are back. Rewind to Dynamite. Thursday is Ask Away. And then into the weekend, we've got Rewind to SmackDown, Collision Course, and our big Dynasty review Sunday night right after the pay-per-view. Um, this pay-per-view looks loaded on paper. Um, so I, th- I think this, this could be... What's the card so far? You want to go through it? Uh, if you want to pull it up, sure. Um, okay, let me just let me just drag it. While, up. while you're grabbing that, I'll just tee up for tomorrow night's NXT episode. They have a steel cage match between Trick Williams and Carmelo Hayes, Ridge Holland against Joaquin Wild, Sol Ruka versus Lola Vice, Noam Dar against Dijak, Tatum Paxley against Thea Hale, AOP against Idris Anofe and Malik Blade, and the return of Tony D'Angelo. While Wednesday's Dynamite will feature from Indianapolis the first time meeting between Will Ospreay and Claudio Castagnoli. Adam Copeland and Willow Nightingale against Julia Hart and Brody King. Kazuchika Okada and the Young Bucks against Pac, Daniel Garcia, and Penta. Deanna Perrazzo against Mariah May. Taz brokering a meeting between Chris Jericho and Hook. And appearances by Samoa Joe, Swerve Strickland, and new IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, John Moxley. All right. Uh, let's go to Dynasty this Sunday. And we've got, according to Wikipedia at least, Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson. We've got the Young Bucks taken on FTR in a, what is now a ladder match for the uh, vacant AEW Tag Team Championships. Julie Hart versus Willow Nightingale in a House Rules match for the AEW TBS titles. Adam Copeland, Eddie Kingston, Mark Briscoe versus the House of Black in a trios match. Timeless Stony Storm taking on Thunder Rosa for the Women's Championship. Kazuchika Okada versus Pac for the Continental title. Roderick Strong versus Kyle O'Reilly for the International Championship. And Samoa Joe versus Swerve for the AEW World Championship. Like this card looks excellent. This card looks yeah. excellent on Sunday. I, um, you know, th- there's you know, multiple matches here that jump out. Um, I'm not even gonna call this a sleeper, but man, Okada and Pack, like, I am so stoked to see that match. And mm-hmm. that might not even be the second or third best match on, on this show, potentially. I mean, Roderick Strong and Kyle O'Reilly, like, it's like that's gonna be solid. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this looks and like a very Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson. You know, yeah, which they have stated is not the main event. So mm-hmm. you would assume Joe and Swerve is your main event on this, I think so on too. this show. Could be the coronation of uh, Swerve Strickland. I think we also have to ask if Jack Perry might make his return. I think everyone's looking at that ladder match as the potential for a Jack Perry return. Mm-hmm. And we'll get a babyface response if he shows up unannounced, I think. Depends what he's doing, but sure, yeah. All right. Well, we uh, will have a plenty of discussion about Dynasty later this week. And then again, we will be live here on the channel right after the pay-per-view Sunday night, whatever time this pay-per-view ends. It's always a late one with AEW. Probably be Monday morning. Actually. Oh, very much so. All right. That's going to uh, wrap things up again. Let's give them that uh, URL one more time where you can go and support our CN Tower Climb postwrestling.com slash WWF as we are going to get our steps up on Sunday morning. Bright and early as we scale to the top of the CN Tower and then get to take the elevator down. Um, yes, yes, that sweet elevator ride. Uh, I, I, the moment I get there, I mean, last year I was like so looking forward to the view from up top after climbing those steps. This year I'm just gonna get down as soon as possible because the stench. That's it's gross, up there dude. It's gross. Disgusting. It's gross going up and it's gross going down, man. It's yeah. like a lot of sweat and God knows what other. Uh, that's it for us. Goodbye.